Hello and greetings to, all, to you all. I hope you've had a really good week with the uh, World War II Conference, Friends of World War II. I'm here from the Army Center of Military History. Dave Hogan's my name. Just wanted to uh, talk a little bit for just a moment about the Center of Military History. You'll see it's on my, uh, my our web address is on the lead slide. Um, we're the Army's clearinghouse for historical activities. And we do a lot of different things on for military history for the Army. We write official histories, which is what my directorate specifically does. We do a lot of historical support work for the Army staff and the Army generally. And we uh, run the Army museums through the Amer Army Museum Enterprise and our brand new National Museum of the U.S. Army, which is due to help open, due to open in Fort Belvoir, Virginia later this year. At a time to be determined. Right now we're looking at November, but there are things going on. Um, our website is a great resource for teachers and students. If you want to look there on it, we've got information on the Army and all of America's wars, uh, publications, commemorative sites, daily posts on social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, a lot of great things on there uh, for you folks who are looking for material on World War II or on the Army generally. So I'd like to talk a little bit, uh, and in a way, this is a very personal talk for me because I grew up in World War with World War II in the 60s and 70s in a place called Muskegon, Michigan, up in the northern Midwest. Uh, and you look back, yeah, World War II was kind of in the background. Kids are thinking about a lot of other things, and and. Uh, you tend to look back at something and find and look at what you're find what you're looking for. Like Cold War historians find everybody diving under desks in the event of a nuclear uh, for, in an exercise in the event of a nuclear attack. But World War II was a presence in certain ways that I would like to describe. Yeah, you know, like most kids of the era, we played war. Uh, we had our little plastic helmets. We were allowed to play with plastic guns at that point. Uh, we had we even had G.I. Joe dolls. I, I remember I had one one for an American G.I., a British commando, a German. And we even had a French resistance doll so that you could that you could put in uh, assorted uniforms. We had Memorial Day parades. Um, every Memorial Day ceremonies at the local cemetery were a big deal. Veterans Park, Muskegon Veterans Park, which you see there by the causeway. American Legion and VFW posts dot the landscape around Muskegon. If you drive by the causeway on the entrance into Muskegon, if you look carefully, you can see in the woods next to the old Continental plant, a, ta a tank testing track, which is where they used to run the Shermans around during World War II to test them before sending them into the field. But, you know, TV had a lot of, lot of army type shows, a lot of service type sh shows, uh, Watch Combat uh, with Vic Morrow it's in there. That was very popular in the mid-60s, McHale's Navy. And, of course, Hogan's Heroes, which we still see in reruns, by and large. Um, we also had the various films, The Guns of Navarone, Is Paris Burning, Tora, 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 and, of course, George C. Scott and Patton. And people still watch those films, of course, now. Eisenhower was the big hero. He, year after year after year, he was named the most admired man in America. Didn't, didn't matter who was president until his death in 1969 when I was 10 years old. And that was a very big deal for a lot of people uh, when he passed on. So World War II was there. It was, we, we had a period there where folks were kind of, one historian has called it America high. Uh, I knew from an early age that we had never lost a war and that this country could do anything if it put its mind to it. Uh, a theme that grew especially insistent in the late 1960s has the Vietnam War reached its peak. In a lot of ways, World War II was the perfect war for the United States. It was, our, it was a kind of war we were uniquely situated to fight. It was our biggest war. It was a war of mass armies, and the United States had a large population with a tradition of armed citizenry. 
the largest armed forces ever mobilized by the United States. 16 million people over the course of World War II served with the U.S. Army. It was a GNP war, and the United States was the world's industrial leader, dubbed ourselves the Arsenal Democracy. Indeed, we had so much excessive productive capacity that we were able to end the Depression. It was a war of mechanization and movement, and the United States had the skills of an industrial society. Hitler had, had famously remarked that America could never be a Rome because Rome was a nation of peasants. He saw the United States as lacking in cohesion and ideals, the kind of tough stolidity that brought victory in war. But what Hitler failed to see was that U.S. military prowess was an extension of its industrial, logical extension of its industrial power. We had a sense of mastery with machines and with distance that the Europeans just could not relate to. Rapid moves across vast distances meant nothing to, to Americans. And this gave birth to the legend of the GI with the wrench who could fix just about anything. You, you looked at every squad supposedly had a guy who was skilled mechanically and could make that, make that machine run if necessary. It was a war of technology. And the United States was used to gadgetry. They were prepared for the unprecedented role that science would play in war, whether through radar, sonar, rockets, the proximity fuse, or the atomic bomb. Even the similarity to an Indian attack, so it's called, that uh, kind of a motif in our history that, that stuck around in the culture. Uh, the, the overwhelming response to the surprise, unprovoked attack. Um, no ambiguity in this case. The Axis were clearly guilty of clearly guilty of aggression, and we could respond in righteous unity to that aggression. And indeed, World War II was the most popular war in the country's history. And if anybody had any doubt about the justice of the Allied cause, we discovered the concentration camps at the end of the war. As Eisenhower said, at least now soldiers will know what they're fighting against. It was also a conventional big unit war, using our full power, so to speak. Um, real fronts with lines marching across the map, you could follow it. We knew where to point our weapons. The enemy forces wore uniforms, were distinguishable. And finally, it had a satisfying outcome. America's enemies completely vanquished, no ambiguity, and then we built them back into stable, friendly democracies, which left the United States, as the, but still the United States has the most powerful nation on earth at, as of VJ Day. So it's no wonder that we have this fascination with World War II. It gave rise to the legend of the greatest generation. Raymond Sun talked in his talk, talked in his presentation about the development of memory in the United States during the 80s and 90s as the veterans start to die off and from and World War II becomes more in the realm of memory. And three of I would call the godfathers of the good war that came out in this period, the god the good war was used in other senses too by people like Studs Terkel. But these three are very widely uh, identified with good war ideology. Stephen Ambrose, historian, the biographer of Dwight D. Eisenhower, author of, also of Band of Brothers, D-Day, and Citizen Soldier. He was the one that promulgated the thesis, the, the sons of Demo democracy, that Americans, the derided soft sons of consumer society of a decadent culture, supposedly, um, Yet, somehow, they were able to defeat, through their merits, the hardened sons of totalitarianism who were supposed to be better at war. Tom Brokaw, the NBC anchorman, author of The Greatest Generation, talked of a generation that came of age during the Depression, during hard times with families losing, fathers losing jobs. Then, Laid it through that period, went to war, saved the world, and beat the fascist dictators. Came home, built their built a great economy, stood against the Soviet Union, and re, and even had the magnanimity to rebuild their enemies at the end of the war. They showed 
the time-honored values of responsibility, duty, honor, faith, and integrity, hard work, unselfishness. It, it, in a sense, history is morality play. Finally, you have Steven Spielberg, the film producer, creator of Saving Private Ryan, which he intended as a salute to the greatest generation. Those who've seen the movie will rem remember distinctly Tom Hanks' admonition to Private Ryan to earn this, to go home and earn this, earn his survival from, from the combat of World War II. And a lot of this grew out of the notion that had, Teddy Roosevelt in particular had advocated during the, during the late 19th century and early 20th and became part of popular culture, that war built character. It was an awful thing. It was it was terrible, terrible thing to endure, but it turned boys into men. That was his message. And furthermore, that World War II was a for a lot of people who went through it, quote unquote, the best times of our lives. It had a purpose. It was the time when issues were clear. There was an evil enemy out there. And as time passed and the memories of the hardships faded, also a time when folks could look back and look at it as a time of discovering adventure, which you see in some of the, some work, like for example, the famous hit musical South Pacific, which reflected some of that feeling in American culture, going to exotic lands, new places where people weren't used to, go, used to going. But was it such a good war? There are a number of people that came up with, particularly in the 90s, the late 80s, 90s, that were at odds with this picture of the good war, this triumphalist picture. One was Paul Fussell, an English professor at the University of Pennsylvania, former platoon leader in World War II, with a reputation as kind of an intellectual crank. But he had some very telling comments to make in his book, Wartime. To Paul Fussell, World War II was still a war, and therefore stupid and sadistic, and dependent on the innocence and naivete of youth. Since then, he said it's been sanitized and romanticized beyond recognition. He referred to the higher Disneyfication of World War II. World War II, he said, was never romantic. It, could, it was too serious to ever be romantic. It left lasting mental and physical scars and, for the most part, was really a big bore. He definitely would have subscribed to the notion of war being... 90% boredom and 10% terror. Michael Adams, in The Best War Ever, referred to area bombing, post-traumatic sy syndrome, discrimination, the s a selfish home front, the internment of Japanese Americans, and race segregation of African Americans as reasons to question why this was the, what, why his title ended up being more sarcastic than descriptive. Uh, John Dower, professor at MIT, wrote his book called War Against, <clears throat> wrote a book on race war against Japanese insects about the dehumanization of the Japanese uh, by, the, by American uh, media. Were our troops so much better? Did we simply overwhelm the, uh, the uh, enemy with materiel? According to Trevor DePew, and who you see pictured there, and Martin Van Krievelt, the Germans had much more fighting power. In the end, showed themselves to be much better fighters in the field than we were. They had, we had inferior tanks, we had dud torpedoes, and bad shoe packs that cost many GIs their feet. Mis mistakes plagued the war effort. The, the San Lo bombing, which killed hundreds of American GIs, the accidental bombing, by American heavy bombers. The, the reference to Murphy's Law, that whenever any true student of war finds Murphy's Law does apply. And for others too, the notion that the US saved the world comes hard, for, comes hard, particularly for the Soviets and the British. From the British point of view, the British held the line while the United States was still getting ready from the Russian point of view, they feel they defeated the bulk of the Nazi army with good reason, and that other theaters of the war were a sideshow. 
both sides, both the British and the Soviets had lost heavily in World War II and their homelands were heavily damaged. And in the end, after it was all done, was the United States more secure? We were left with, a, with the atomic age, no Royal Navy to shield us anymore. The Royal Navy had, had decreased in size and impact. And really in the modern age of modern technology, no ocean shield to protect us as in the past. So while we were the most powerful nation in the world in 1945, somehow we didn't feel like the most powerful nation in the world. Now both sides have something to say in this good war, bad war debate. Um, I don't think the greatest generation would deny that war is hell. Yes, the greatest generation wasn't perfect. Certainly the discrimination, the, the a lot of the, the segregation, even Brokaw would admit that. Yes, racism in the Pacific did exist. The Americans were not above taking Japanese ears as trophies. But it went both ways. The Japanese, too, had their own race war. And after Pearl Harbor, Americans felt that there was a release, an obligation to conduct savage war. Um, and World War II did have, it, have some implications for the civil rights struggle. Because after World War II, when the United States was confronting communism, it could no longer justify race segregation and discrimination and claim that it was the bastion of liberty and freedom at the same time. It's no accident that the civil rights civil rights movement came hard upon the end of World War II in the post-war era. There's no way to come to a conclusive answer on combat performance between the Americans and the Germans, Japanese, who had the best units, who were the best fighters. You can find evidence in both ways on that one. And, but it is true that American technology was not always the best. While the tanks were reliable, and more reliable and maneuverable than the opposing German models, they did not have the armament and firepower that the best German models did. It's also true that we had torpedoes at the start of the war that, that did not function correctly and cost the Americans dearly in many of the early naval battles. Yes, the role of the Soviet Union and Britain were, was crucial. The roles of the Soviet Union and Britain were crucial, but the United States was fighting a two ocean war holding out against both Germany and, and Japan, both Atlantic and Pacific, Europe and Pacific. The, uh, only the United States was fighting in every theater except the Eastern Front. May not have made the Americans feel more secure at the end of the war, but there was a feeling that World War II was a legitimate cause against evil. And we can ask ourselves the question, what if the Axis had won and what, what would the world look like today. And by no means was it a foregone conclusion from during the war that we would win until very late. So what do we choose to look at? What images do we think do we think of when we go back and look at World War II? Images that that tell us what people what people came out of the war in terms of their attitudes. Certain Certain images, certain memories do affect the Americans and did affect the American view. In the case of Munich, the Munich meeting in the fall of 1938 between Prime Minister Chamberlain and Adolf Hitler. Chamberlain and Fr France agreed to give Hitler Czechoslovakia. In exchange, Hitler said, this is my last territorial demand. Within a few months, Hitler was annexing all of Czechoslovakia and, take, and preparing to invade Poland. The impact on the United States was, was tremendous in terms of how we viewed foreign policy. In the 1930s, we had been an isolationist country with the idea that Europe was someone else's problem. Disillusionment had set in with World War I, a crusade gone sour. A, a perception strengthened by historical research at the time, which concluded that World War I had broken out was really no one's fault and had no real purpose. It seemed that war was terrible, 
It never, so, it never solved anything, the lessons of World War I, that never again should we fight a war, and that both sides were at fault, and this in turn created a moral equivalence between the two sides. A tendency to see German claims as justified and a willingness to cut a deal to preserve peace, practically peace at any price, and Chamberlain was applauded by on both sides of the Atlantic when he returned from Munich. World War II changed all that for the United States. Munich became a code word for sellout. There was a feeling that somehow the United States was responsible. We had not taken an active role. We had not drawn a line in the sand against dictators, where if you give them an inch, they take a yard. And that there is such a thing as a good war. Evil does exist. Some things must be fought. And from now on, every pacifist in his arguments has to deal with the Hitler question. It affected the United States all through the post-war period. Korea, Vietnam, and you could say most recently Iraq. But now it competes with what you could call the Vietnam Syndrome, the notion that the United States is not the world's policeman and that we can't impose our political and cultural way of viewing things. We can't, can't fight everything we don't like around the world. And you look at the debate over Iraq in the 2000s, there were those who saw contest with evil, no room for compromise, and others who saw the United States involved in a meaningless war and others' internal affairs. Pearl Harbor. Everyone but John Belushi in Animal House knows about this one. Used to be we could hide behind oceans, the giant moats, the Atlantic and the Pacific. But after World War II, the United States no longer felt it was invulnerable. That technology could now span the oceans. Even with our security as the most powerful nation in, Europe, in the world, we have an age of insecurity. Even as we expand our definition of security to encompass the world from places, people that could hurt us, to the point that some guys meeting in a basement someplace putting together an atomic, putting together a an explosive device can hurt us. The Pearl Harbor created a, a fixation with the idea of surprise attacks and the importance of intelligence in the Central Intelligence Agency to warn us of those attacks. The odd thing is that even with World War II, the threat was mostly distant. It never really reached the Western Hemisphere. It seemed more imaginary than real. The Axis never attack the Western Hemisphere unless you include saboteurs and incendiary and balloons. I guess maybe if you include Hawaii in the Western Hemisphere, but, but, not, uh, but not an attack on the American homeland. But perhaps because of this, these attacks were more imaginary, more, more in prospect, it made it more terrifying. There was a bit of a respite with the end of the Cold War, but not for long. And then, of course, 9-11, you get all the comparisons to Pearl Harbor. Strengthens the tendency to look back at World War II. The arsenal of democracy and the faith in American productive capacity leading to victory. This belief in America and, big, and bigness and our prodigies of production, our ability to turn out massive amounts of armaments and weapons and materiel where necessary. The Axis powers like Germany and Japan have their own myth that we overwhelmed them, not, not because we were more virtuous, but because we had more materiel, more resources, more troops. And in truth, there is some, there's some truth to that. The invulnerable American homeland able to produce a lot of material for both the United States and its allies. Much of what we produced went for Lend-Lease and kept, helped keep the allies going. But when we fight later wars, when we fight wars in Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf, the global war against terrorism, production and the ability to produce large amounts of, good, of weapons is not so important. You need more political cultural acumen, more work with hearts and minds, some of these arguments start to, start to come up in people's minds. Another famous image of World War II, Iwo Jima, a famous photo even central to our movie culture. Faith in American unity, 
All for one patriotism reflected in this picture. It, it includes a mix of people, including at one at least one Native American, Ira Hayes. Nostalgia for a period that once unified the United States can accomplish anything. Underlying the Cold War consensus. Comforting the a comforting notion of national unity that we are, are all together and unified, and the frustration when we are not, as came as as came apparent in the Vietnam War. Actually, when you look at American wars over the course of history, there has been more dissent than uh, unity in American wars down through history. But World War II is still our model. Somehow, this image, it seems biblical. We have climbed the mount. The flag serves as a religious motif beyond a national symbol of a civic religion unifying God and his special country, an image strengthened in the Cold War when we were fighting the quote-unquote godless communists. The Holocaust, a chilling portrait of human nature and of evil's effects. World War II confirmed a trend that had started with World War I of growing cynicism and worry about human nature. For so long, we had had faith in our better angels and in progress. It underlay our faith in democracy. It, underlay, it underlayed Western civilization's faith that it was superior and that it was moving ever upward. Now, after World War I and then World War II, there was more doubt than ever that we would reach the millennium. And what made the Holocaust even worse was that it was done by Germany. Germany was part of Western culture, with its literature, its poets, its composers. Chillingly, its systematic implementation of mass production to execution uh, had its impact. This belief that how how could uh, how could a civilized people be be capable of such a step? Thus, we resolved never again, and genocide justifies humanitarian intervention in places like the Balkans. Even liberals are more willing to intervene abroad, and for a period, isolationism is put in eclipse. Furthermore, after a period of intense anti-Semitism in the United States, World War II gave anti-Semitism a bad name, and it and increased the likelihood that Americans would support Israel in the post-war period. And then there's the atomic bomb. We still have controversy over its use. Was it necessary? Was it drop, really dropped to end the war, or was it dropped to impress the Russians? Those of us remember back to the Smithsonian controversy of the mid-1990s that Raymond Sun referred to in his, his talk. In the Smithsonian Institution, the temple of American technological worship, and the dispute when the Smithsonian tried to put on a more critical interpretation of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Most Americans still believe the use of the atomic bomb to be justified and that it was used to end the war. Gives them, gave them pride in the victory of superior American technology, but also this belief that in the future we'd better be on the cutting edge of technology leading to fixations we currently have in the military and among our leadership that we never fall behind in terms of military technology. The search for a technological solution, even a panacea, a wonder weapon, and when we do seem to fall behind, as was the case with Sputnik in 1957, there's a much alarm in American society. When you put the atomic age together with the Holocaust, the ner it creates incredible nervousness. Science could be our doom. The genie is out of the bottle. The realization that once others get it, it can be used on us. And with the growing danger of proliferation, weapons of mass destruction, how do you stop an idea? In the end, it probably did make another world war unthinkable. We probably would have had another one by now if it weren't for the atomic bomb and for nuclear weapons. 
When, in Korea and Vietnam, there was a more careful use of force. But in the process, we thought we knew how to manage it. Defense intellectuals, like doctors with a prescription, you just respond with the right dose of violence to send the message that you're trying to send. Result in the disaster in Vietnam, which in the end proved that the a war is not that easy a thing to manage. So, we have talked a lot about the myths that have grown up regarding World War II. Now, a myth has bad connotations in our culture. It implies the untrue. It's not necessarily the case. A myth usually has some truth mixed into it, but it does serve a social purpose in reinforcing solidarity and meaning. Our myths served us well in World War II. Do they still? We live in a different world from the 1940s, a world more cynical about our politics. Most people in 1940s America worshiped Franklin D. Roosevelt. Very different terms of our post-industrial economy, much more diverse society, and an intellectual world that warns us there are no truths, just perceptions and constructions, mental constructions. War itself has changed doesn't lend itself to the big unit war, it seems. We, we quickly liberated Iraq in 2003, yet we came stuck there in part perhaps because we were still in, attracted to the aura of the big one, the World War II. Paul Wolfowitz, the former sec, Assistant Secretary of Defense, when he visited the Society for Military History years ago, claimed that the lessons of World War II were, were what drove the invasion of Iraq. And the changes of, in terms of meaning of war itself. Now war can be a war against climate change, can be a war against a pandemic. How do we find in this area, age of uncertainty, of nebulousness, of problems that don't seem to lend themselves to uh, massive solutions, how do we maintain our certainties while grasping nuance? Turn to a minister from Detroit, Cold War thinking, thinker named Reinhold Niebuhr, the father of Christian realism in the 30s and 40s, the man that George Kennan called the father of us all, and a, and a man of his generation. In retrospect at World War II, he took a hard look at human nature, the sin and evil within all. But as a clergyman, he recognized the need to stand against evil in, world, in the world. He believed in ethics and foreign policy. But he also argued the need for humility, for, for the need, the sense of irony, the limitations, knowing the obstacles of imperfect humans seeking ideal solutions. No one had realized the ironies of power more than Reinhold Niebuhr. And no one could appreciate the ironies of the 20th century, the origins of World War I, World War II, the irony of Iraq and the, clim and the struggles against climate change and the pandemic that we face today. Thank you.